Hi, I'm Gary Katz. I want to thank all the folks who bought copies of my DVD programs over the last 20 years. If it wasn't for their support and the support of companies like Windsor One and Stabila, I never would have been able to produce what turned out to be a 10 program series on mastering finished carpentry. Those 12 to 20 year old videos look pretty terrible compared to streaming video today. And that's why I'm no longer selling the DVDs, but the carpentry techniques haven't aged much at all. And that's why I'm making them available here for free. Enjoy. Welcome back to the Mastery and Finish Carpentry DVD series. In previous programs, I've covered mastering a miter saw, installing casing and baseboard, conquering crown molding, and I went overboard a bit on wainscoting. Now it's time to deal with doors. I don't know why this program came so late in the series. I've probably spent more time in my career as a carpenter hanging doors than I have any other job. And I've enjoyed installing almost every one of them, except maybe the first 10 or 20. And that's the reason for this program. Hanging doors, even pre-hungs, is a tricky business. You have to see the whole picture before you start. And that's the secrets of succeeding at finish work and to life too. Understanding how one problem relates to another. Seeing the whole picture with doors is tough. There's so many things to watch out for. That's the goal of this program, to show you some step-by-step -step routines that work, to demonstrate important techniques, and to point out pitfalls that can be avoided and shorten the learning curve, to help control chaos. Most of the time, that's what carpentry is all about, controlling chaos. Sometimes life is too. We're standing on the hinge side of this jam. The hinges point out this way. This is a right-hand door. If I stand with my butt in the butts, this door would swing just like my right arm. I'll talk more about that in the next program on installing pre-hungs. If you look close, you'll see that the hinge mortises here are much too deep. Just what you'd expect from an old jam. Pretty soon we'll see how that affects the fit of the door. This jam is pretty cockeyed too. The reveal across the head is out because the head jams out the way most old jams are. If I hold this level up, you can see that the bubble on the vial is right against the line. And the head's out of square too. Let me put this square on this corner and you can see daylight right through here and it rocks because this whole corner here is out of square. And the jam legs are out as well. We're in my studio, and this is a set, but this jam is just like hundreds of others I've run into on remodels. Look at the hinge jam here. It has a belly in it that I can see through. It must be over an eighth of an inch. You can't use a short level for this. You need a level that's the full height of the jam. Look at this level here. It's a great level, but it's only four feet tall, and it's sitting flat against this jam, because it's not tall enough to pick up the bow that's in this jam leg. And on this side, there's a bow in the strike side that makes the level rock over a quarter of an inch. Both of these legs are out to lunch. I'm gonna show you a method for scribing a door to fit this jam, and hopefully the door will swing and fit well the first time with just a few adjustments. I didn't come up with this technique. I learned it from Royal and Al Schaefer, and every time I demonstrate this process or teach it to a new carpenter, I mention the Schaefer brothers. From the 1950s through the 1980s, those guys were door hanging kings in Southern California. That was before pre-hung doors existed. They had to hang doors fast and good, and they did. I'm gonna show you the system they used, which is the one I still use today. I have to stand on the stop side of this jam, back here in, this, in my studio, in my shop, to scribe this door. So we're gonna move the camera back over to here so you can see what I'm doing when I put this door in the opening. Oh, there you are. Well, now you can see the back wall of my studio. There's the old roll-up door right there up above the jam, and you can see how bad the head of this jam is. It's really at a level. Maybe a little worse than the ones you find on some jobs, but maybe not. 
This is the kind of jam where you could really end up in trouble if you just hinged the door and started hanging it right on the jam. I remember when I first began hanging doors, I worked on a jam where the head rose from the hinge jam, just like this, where it's rising up. And I had to keep moving the hinges on the door down to keep raising the door up so I could keep scribing a little more off the head of the door to fit the jam. You can skip all that nonsense if you scribe the door to fit the jam first. Now I need to get this door as close to the old jam as I can before I scribe it. First, I'm going to set it on a pair of shims. This is a door hook. The Schaefer brothers used one that was really similar to this. It's probably one of the most useful tools a door hanger can own. It allows one guy to scribe doors alone without a helper, which is what efficiency and productivity are all about. Besides, when you rely on a helper to hold the door, they don't pay enough attention to what you're doing. Your helpers are usually the youngest kids on the crew, and just when you're about finished scribing the door, their grip will loosen and the door will slip and move a little. And even if the door just moves a fraction of an inch, you still have to practically start all over again. You can make one of these door hooks pretty easily. Watch the slideshow that's on this DVD and you'll see what I mean. I've adjusted this door hook so it'll just grab and stretch across the top of the jam and pull the door right tight against the jam. Now I'm going to adjust the door so it's parallel to the jam. I know this jam is out everywhere, but I want to start with it as close to parallel as possible. I use a small pry bar to do this. It's a carpet layers bar, and I can move the door around on the shims almost any way I want. If I want to tip the door up a little and get it closer to parallel on this side, I'll just take some of the weight off the door with a pry bar and slide the shim in a little bit further. And I can draw the door in closer to the jam on the bottom here, too. And the same on this side. I'm going to take the door and drop this shim out just a hair. And I'll push this one in just a little bit, too. Just so both sides are closer to parallel to, the jam to both jams. Now, the door is shifted too much in this direction. I can slide the door back. I can move the whole door at once just by putting my pry bar in the center of the door and sliding it sideways. I'm kind of rotating the pry bar, and I'm bringing the whole door back closer to this jam. Now it looks pretty close to this jam. I'm sighting straight up the jam between the jam and the door. And on this side, I'm doing the same thing, but I need to move the door just a hair more in this direction and maybe drop it just a little bit on this side. And that should do it. That's pretty close to perfect. But sometimes, you don't want to hang the door perfectly parallel to the jams, like this door. Remember, the head of this door is, is out of level big time. Let's measure that so that we can see the whole picture. Look, the distance between the jam and the bottom of the top rail on the strike side is 4 and a 16th. And the distance between the jam and the bottom of the top rail on the hinge side, it measures 3 and 7 eighths. That's more than 3 sixteenths of an inch. If I cut this door to fit that way, the top rail will have a slope to it that even a kid could notice from across the room. Now here's a point I try to make whenever I teach new carpenters. Our responsibility isn't to make things perfectly plumb and perfectly square and perfectly level. Some carpenters think that way, but I believe our job is to make things look plumb and square and level, to make things fit and look finished. Sometimes that means cheating a little, splitting the difference. I mean, that's a phrase we all use for a good reason. In this case, I'm going to split the difference and cheat this door over a little to hide the fact that the jam's out of plumb. Sure, on some jobs, you might be able to remove the jam and reset it. But this example is supposed to be a situation where you can't move the jam. Maybe there's brick all the way around the outside. Or maybe on the inside, there's wallpaper. And you don't want to remove the casing because you might tear the wallpaper. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise the hinge style just a little bit. There, perfect. Now we're up to a strong 3 and 15 16. So 
really the top of the door isn't out much at all, less than an eighth of an inch. Somebody with a sharp eye might pick that out, but it's the best of both worlds. Remember, I cheated the casing on the other side, which helps hide that the jam's out some too. I'm going to check the hinge and lock styles next, just to be sure the door's centered. This one's four and a sixteenth. This one's four and a quarter, so I'm going to take the door and shift it back toward the hinge jam just a little bit. That should do it. Okay, now this is something to be careful of. You don't want to plane too much off the lock style. If you plane more than three and three quarters off of this, you're going to have trouble getting a deadbolt in. Hey, take my word on this one. The older Schlage deadbolts need almost three and seven eighths of an inch. At least you want that much meat on the door, especially a French door, or you might hit the glass when you're boring for the latch. You can guess how I know that. So always check the lock style before scribing the door. If you've got an opening that's too narrow for the door, you can take more meat off the hinge style, but not too much off the lock style. Okay, the door's all set. It's centered in here and I'm ready to scribe it. This is an inch and three eighths door. So I'm gonna spread my scribes about an eighth of an inch. Now this is important, so pay close attention. I want the gaps around the door, the space between the door and the jam, to be a strong sixteenth of an inch when I'm finished on the hinge side. A uh, strong sixteenth of an inch is like a fat dime or a nickel or something. Some carpenters prefer a nickel, which is probably safer if you live in an area where the humidity swings a lot. Here in Southern California, we don't have that kind of problem, and my brother always tells me he likes to see a dime. So let's talk about a dime. If you want a bigger gap, spread your scribes a little more. I'll talk about this again when I set the angle on my plane, but right now, I want you to understand why I spread my scribes more than the gap that I want. I'm standing on the stop side of the door, the side of the jam that's going to get the door stop on it. That's the side of the door with the short point of the bevels. That's why I spread my scribes a little more than the amount I want for the hinge and the strike gaps. The hinge barrels point out this way toward my studio. That's where the long point of the bevels are on the hinge and strike styles. The door is beveled on the styles so it will clear the jam as it closes. I'll talk more about that later, but right now, just notice how the door is narrower across the stop side, across the short points of the bevels, than it is across the hinge side. With my scribe set, I can scribe the hinge style and the lock style. Now, you might be thinking, well, gee, that's real easy because there's no stop on the jam. But actually, this is easy even when there's stop on the jam. Even with rabbited jams, this is easy. Because you can take your scribes and you can lay them down right up against the jam just like this. And run them between the door stop and the door right on the jam on both sides. I didn't put stop on this jam so that you could see what I'm doing more clearly, but if you notice, my scribe line is exactly in the same place, even when I'm laying the scribes down on the jam, because you can lay the scribes down. You can lay them down this way or this way. You can rotate the scribes, but you can't lay them down so that they aren't perpendicular to the jam. The scribes have to be perpendicular to the jam or you'll be squiggling a line, you won't be scribing the door to the jam. Now, that's one of the reasons I like to use a mechanical pencil in my scribes. It allows me to get inside and lay these scribes down tight. I still have an old cross pencil in this set of scribes. You can't buy these anymore, not with a nine millimeter lead. This is the, um, probably the most expensive way to go anyway. The least expensive scribes you can find is a Pentel pencil, like this one here. This has a nine millimeter lead, which is the same size lead I use in the cross pencil, but this one only costs like 10 or 12 bucks. Don't get the five millimeter lead, it breaks too easily. And sure, this lead will break too, but not nearly as much. The trick is to keep those scribes perpendicular to the jam. You can lay them down behind the stop, 
but you can't rotate the scribes. Otherwise, like I said, you're just going to be squiggling a line. Now, when I scribe the top of the door, I like to squeeze the scribes closed and take a minimal amount off the top. That way, you're not taking too much meat off up there, and this top lock rail will still look really nice. So I'll squeeze my scribes closed and make sure that I'm going to reach the top of the door at both ends of the jam, at that end and this end. Oh, there's plenty of door here, remember? Because this is that jam that's cockeyed. It's at a level. So I'm on the jam here by about an eighth of an inch. And over here, I'll be taking off about a quarter. So I can scribe the top of the jam, too, just like so. Now, while I'm standing here, some of you might be thinking, hey, with the door up against the jam like this, why not lay out the hinges on the door? You know, just transfer the line of the mortise on the hinge straight across to the door. I know some door hangers who do that. My brother likes marking the hinge locations that way. But you have to be able to see perfectly level straight across this top hinge gain to get an accurate mark. And I found it's really tough to do that with real confidence. I mean, to make sure that you have exact head gap on your doors. I'll show you that in a second. But first, we've got a little bit more to go here. There's one more side of this door that needs to be scribed, the bottom. If you're hanging an exterior door, you should have the threshold, door shoe, and sill nosing on hand before you hang the door so you know exactly how much to cut off the bottom of the door. If it's an interior door, then you need to know how high the carpet's going to be, or the stone, or the tile, so you can cut the door and seal the bottoms while the door's at your bench. You can easily get two coats of sealers, sometimes three on the bottom of a door, while you're cutting, mortising, and planing it to fit. Before we move this door now, there's one more step, and it might be the most important step. Be sure to put an X on the hinge side right here before you move the door. Now, that's not the direction the hinge barrel is going to point in. The hinge barrel isn't going to point out this way. It's going to point out that way. It's just the side of the door that the hinges are installed on. This is now the hinge style. That X is a critical failsafe. Once you learn how to scribe doors, there's very little measuring involved. In fact, you take your tape measure out only two times, but both of those times, you're going to want to look for that X. Let's measure the hinge locations right now. I'll push this door out of the way first. Every door has a gap between the top of the door and the top of the jam. We call that the head gap. It's usually around an eighth of an inch and allows the door to close without rubbing on the head jam. When I measure the hinge locations, I pretend that the top of the tape measure is the top of the door. I put it against the head jam, and then I slide it down about an eighth of an inch for head gap, just like so. I can measure that gap precisely by watching the tape measure as it slides past the top hinge. See, here it measures seven inches almost right on. That's tight, so I'm going to slide it down an eighth of an inch until it's at six and seven eighths. That'll give me exactly an eighth of an inch head gap. Now I'm going to pinch the tape measure right here and hold it there with my other thumb and pull it down to get the other hinge measurements. If I had a hinge in the center, I'd pick up that measurement right now. And this lower one's really easy to get now. I can see it's at 64 inches. There's only two mortises in this jam, which isn't uncommon. But I did that, really, because that's all we need for this demonstration. I write those hinge measurements down right on the door, on the hinge style of the door. That's 6 and 7 eighths and 64. You know. It seems like every door hanger has a different method for measuring the hinge layouts. I've known some guys who use a story pole. They put a piece of door stop like this, or a piece of one by two, right up against the head jam, just like that. And then they mark where the hinges are right on the story pole. I even know some other guys that'll take a nickel, put it up on top of that story pole, and put that up against the head jam, and then make their mark on the story pole at both hinges. That way. When they put the story pole on the door to transfer the lines, all they have to do is flush the top of the story pole up with the top of the door after they've cut the door, and they'll have a perfect hinge layout. Personally, I don't like doing it that way. I like using my tape measure. It's something I've gotten used to doing. It's something the Schaefers taught me to do, and they had a good reason for doing it.
If you want to be really efficient on a job, you have to carry the least amount of tools. And when you're scribing a door, all you really need is a tape measure. And I've got it with me anyway. I've done it this way for almost 20 years. You know, but that doesn't mean it's the best way. It's just a good way. You figure out what's the best way for you. The last thing I do while I have the door near the opening is measure the distance to the lock strike and subtract an eighth of an inch from that measurement. So I hit my tape measure up against the top jam and then come down to the lock strike if there is one. Now there isn't on this jam, but if there were one, I'd measure to the center of the lock strike and subtract that eighth of an inch for head gap. And I'd write that measurement down right on the lock style here. Now all the measurements are right on the door. If my door bench is in some other room of the house or downstairs or something, I won't have to come back up to this opening. All the information is right on the door. And when I'm hanging more than one door in a home, instead of writing an X like this on the door, I'll put a number on the door, and I'll put the same number on the jam. That way I can scribe a whole bunch of doors and bring them down to my bench and process them all at the same time. I used to watch Royal Schaefer scribe 30 doors, sometimes even more, before he'd even start hanging one. He'd carry them all to his bench first, and then the sawdust would really fly, because all he'd be doing is the same thing over and over and over again. I'll show you that next. Most doors weigh a lot more than this little inch of 3 8 interior door. 3068 and 3080 solid core doors can hurt you if they're not moved carefully. And it's not just the weight of one door, it's the weight of all the doors you're gonna hang in one day, or one week, or one month that'll wear on you. Plus, the smarter you are about moving doors, the more energy you'll have and the more doors you'll be able to hang. The first step at the door bench is cutting the top and the bottom of the door. I always place the door down on my bench flat with the X up and the X toward me. That way, after I've cut the top and the bottom, I just have to lift one edge of the door up and then set it down on edge into my door hook. I don't have to spin it around or flip it over. That's when a heavy door can really hurt you. I'll show you what I mean as soon as I finish cutting this door. On this door, I don't have to cut the bottom, just the top. And I'm going to use a Festool TS-55 saw and a guide rail to make this cut. Here's the saw, and here's the guide rail. The head jam over there had a little bit of a bow to it. So if you look at this edge here with the guide rail, you'd notice that I can't follow the scribe line with the guide rail. That's because of the bow in the head. I'm going to have to set this guide rail on here a little bit wide of the mark and then clean that up later with a plane after I make the cut. I'll show you how to do that in just a minute. Now the nice thing about these guide rails is you don't have to worry about tear out on the face of the door. But if the scribe line has a bow like I have here, then you should score the scribe line first with a utility knife. Just take your square and run your utility knife over the style of the door several times. Don't try to push real hard on the first pass. Make several light, shallow cuts first. Don't push real hard right away, because if you do, sometimes the knife can skip up over the top of your blade. And if you're pushing really hard on your square here, your blade's going to come right across your fingertip, and it'll cut your fingertip right off. So make really light little score lines on here, just several of them, one after the other, until you get a nice deep score line. Now, on a slab door, you have to score the whole door, so you have to use a straight edge for that. On this door, you don't have to, but no matter what, you have to score a line across the back of the style, just behind your scribe line, just like this, right here. And if you don't do that, Wood can blow out real bad when you make the saw cut, or if by chance you come out the back of the door with your planer. But I'm going to show you how to plane the top of the door so you don't have to worry about that. Now, this saw, it's different than most circular saws. This is the TS-55. For most doors, I use my larger TS-75 saws. It won't bog down no matter what, but this saw will be just fine on an inch and three-eighths door. I'll go slow so I won't be pushing it too hard. Both saws operate the same way. The guard doesn't pull up like it does on circular saws. The whole saw plunges down. 
And there's a riming knife back here. That prevents kickback if the kerf starts to close. But the riving knife won't prevent all types of kickback. One of my guide rails has a nick right back here, a little kerf about two inches long. If you want to avoid getting one on your guide rail, be sure to bring your saw up to full RPMs before plunging into the workpiece. Otherwise, the teeth hit the wood at a real low pitch angle, and the saw has a tendency to skip backwards. Let me put this guide rail on here. So we'll line this guide rail up right on the line, and I'm going to be wide of the line up here. We'll have to plane that off a little bit later. Then I'll tighten this clamp up, and I'll make this cut. See, I was able to follow the scribe line all the way through here, but right in here, I'm proud of the scribe line. And I'm going to finish this off with a planer. The depth of cut on the planer is adjusted with this handle. It's kind of like the throttle on a motorcycle. It's tough to change the depth of cut while you're holding the plane on its side, so here's a simple trick. Set the depth of the plane so it'll just cut like maybe 16th of an inch at the most, maybe a 32nd. And then come into the door and plane until you reach the line. So what I'll do is, I've got it set so it'll just cut about a 32nd or a 16th of an inch. And I'm just going to plane into here until I touch the line here. Then I'm going to start over again and plane again until I reach the line again. That time, the second time I'll be further, along the, further back on the door. And then the third time I'll probably get right to the line. So you end up with a perfect scribe line. Oh, you know, the idea is, to get to the scribe line at the very edge of the door, right here, because that's the final goal. You can even adjust the depth of cut to reach the scribe line if you need to get there a little bit quicker. Once you reach the scribe line, you can turn the plane over and finish the job from the top. Now, I don't have to take much off here, but just be sure the plane is always zeroed out when you come back to this end of the door. Otherwise, you'll blow out the back of the style. I'm just going to take a quick pass right here, just to straighten this up. Then, take a sanding block like this. and ease the top edge of the door. You know, while the door is lying flat in your bench like this, it's a good time to put a coat of sealer on the top edge. And if you cut the bottom, or even if you don't, put a coat of sealer on the bottom edge too. Before you stand the door up, on edge in your bench. And that's what I'm going to do right now. With the X toward me, all I have to do is raise the door until it's vertical, just like this. Then pick up the whole weight of the door in my left hand. I have to carry the whole weight of the door, but only for a moment. That makes it a lot easier. And I don't have to bend my back, which also makes it easier. And I don't have to bend my knees either. I just move the door to the side of the bench, then set the far end down on the ground, down here. And after that, I'm only carrying a fraction of the door's weight, and it's easy to lower this edge into the rung on my door bench and into the door hook. Just like so. Then I can lift the opposite end right up into this hook. 
That's the only way to work with heavy doors without letting them beat you up. Notice that the X is now up. And that's the way I always want the door on my bench when I start planing the styles, because I always plane the hinge style first. Having simple rules like that, ones you follow without exception, is the best way to prevent door hanging mistakes. And trust me, there's plenty of ways to screw this up. I think I've done it every one of them at least once. I always hinge the doors first so the X is always up. The X and the scribe lines are always against my bench. The bench acts just like the door stop. It stops the door from falling over. That means the bevels on the door always point down toward my bench. Most doors are beveled between two and three degrees. I use this little gauge block here to set the angle on my plane. I learned this trick from a roadshow attendee. I wish I could remember all the names of carpenters who have taught me great tricks and techniques. This one is especially important when you're using a planer because you want the bevel angle to be exactly the same every time you hang doors. That way you can dial in the spread of your scribes and the amount that you bevel your door, and when you swing your doors the first time, they'll fit almost perfectly every single time. Let me show you what I mean. I'll take the plane and loosen the fence back here, and I'll take this two degree block, and I'll put it in here and adjust this fence till it comes right up to that gauge block. Let me get this in here and close it up so it comes right up to the gauge block and then tighten down the fence. Because you want that two degree angle to be precise. I used to plane doors with a Porta Cable 126 planer which has the motor hanging off this side of the tool. For that plane I always had to hold my index finger right on the leading edge of the fence and so I could hold the fence flat against the face of the door. If the fence isn't snug against the door, then the bevel will change as you're cutting the door, and it'll change the fit of the door. But the fast tool plane has the motor right in line on top of the tool, so you don't have to hold on to the fence. I can hold the depth control handle right here and just ride this plane right across the edge of the door. The easiest way to plane a door is to cut the edge parallel to the scribe line as quickly as possible, leaving as much meat as you can before the scribe line. That way, the last few passes are cut at exactly the same depth and you don't have to dial the cut down as you're making those last two passes. I use the plane to knock down the edges of the door too, and then after I've knocked down the edges, I'll take a sanding block like this one. You can make these out of a block of wood, and you really should before you sand a door, because if you don't, it's real easy to pick up a sliver of wood, especially on a fur door. And you don't want that to happen, because if you pick up a big sliver, you can just ruin a door real quick. All right, now it's time to mortise for the hinges. There's two times when you pull out a tape measure while you're processing the door. Just before you mortise for the hinges and just before you drill for the locks. Both times you look for that X. Right there's the X. That's the only way to ensure that you don't hinge a door or bore a door upside down. I measure for the hinges with a sharp 2 and 5 tenths pencil. It leaves a mark that's almost the size of a knife line. The top hinge is six and seven eighths, so I'm going to make a mark right here at six and seven eighths, and I'm going to put an X on the side of the line that the hinge goes on right here. Remember, this is the top of the door, so the hinge has to go down from that line. 
For left-hand doors, the top of the door is at the top of my bench up there. For right-hand doors, the top of the door is down here at the bottom of my bench. So that little x is important. Sometimes the x is on the left side of the line, sometimes it's on the right side of the line. Pay attention. Now the bottom hinge is at 64 inches down here. So I'm going to make my mark at 64 and put the little x on the downhill side of that line. Next, I draw a nice clean line with my square right through that 64 inch mark and I'll come up here and do the same thing at the top hinge. I want that straight line because it makes it a lot easier to position the hinge template. I use templates for all the work I do on doors when I'm installing hardware. And I use a template guide in my router, that's what this bushing is, to protect the template from the router bit. The diameter of the template guide is a sixteenth of an inch larger than the cutter, so that the template is a sixteenth of an inch wider than the hardware I'm installing in every direction. That means that the total opening is an eighth of an inch bigger than the hardware. Before you place the template on the door, be sure to adjust the back set stops on the back of the template. You can loosen these screws, this is a homemade template, you can loosen these screws here or on this template that's made by Templeco, you can loosen these four screws and slide these back set stops back and forwards to adjust them. If you don't adjust the back set stops, the door might not hang flush with the jam. It might be proud and stick way out of the jam or it might hang too far in on the jam and end up being stop bound. When you hang a new door in an old jam, you have to match the hinge back set on the door with the hinge back set on the jam. And hinge back sets are a little like crown molding, upside down and backwards. If the hinge back set is too deep, the door will be drawn out of the jam and away from the stop. If the hinge back set is too shallow, the door will be too close to the stop and might rub on the stop. To adjust the back set, start by placing the template on the jam right on top of the existing hinge mortise. The back set stops should be adjusted so the template extends past the hinge mortise about a sixteenth of an inch. If the door stop is in the way and prevents the template from reaching the back of the hinge mortise, then measure the distance from the face of the jam to the back of the hinge mortise. That's the hinge back set. Set the stops on the template for that measurement plus a sixteenth of an inch because the template guide is offset from the cutter by a sixteenth of an inch. So when I place the template on the door, I have to position it a sixteenth of an inch beyond the layout line for the hinge. I've learned to eyeball that amount. It's not that tough to do. Now notice that the open end of this template where the hinge barrels come out, it's pointed toward me. Remember, the hinge barrels always point toward your belly. We're standing on the hinge side of the door. The door bench is on the stop side of the door, always. Dust collection on this little router isn't nearly 100% like it is with the planer, but most of the dust gets picked up, which makes it easier and faster to cut the mortises. There's very little dust buildup against the edges of the template, so the dust doesn't interfere with the template guide. template down to this end now and we'll get this edge, this mortise too. You can use quarter inch radius hinges which fall right into the mortise left by the router bit. But for this door, I'm going to use square corner hinges. So I have to square up the corners left by the router bit here. And to do that, I'm going to use this little tool. It's 
called a corner chisel. I'm just going to set the corner chisel in, give it a smack. And while I'm at it, I'll do this mortise up here too. Next, I'm going to drill pilot holes for each screw using a VEX bit. Now, a VEX bit is really cool. It's a critical step when you're hanging a door. If you don't drill pilot holes, the screws will go wherever they want. I've seen screws push hinges toward the edge of the mortise out here so hard that they'll split the face of the door right off. You don't want that to happen. Now, a VIX bit is nothing but a self-centering drill bit with a spring-loaded housing on the outside of the VIX bit allows you to center the drill bit right in a screw hole so that the drill bit ends up dead center where you want the screw to be placed. When you drive hinge screws, make sure they seat firmly. But don't overdrive them or they'll strip. And brass screws will shear right off. A good cordless drill like this is, is a real must to have. But you'll also notice that I'm feathering the trigger just to be safe. In other words, when you drive a screw, don't squeeze the trigger all the way down. After all, when you drive a car, you rarely push the pedal to the floor. Drive a screw the way an old man drives a car. Give it some power, then feather it off. Then give it some more power, then feather it off. That way you have complete control of the torque, regardless of the clutch setting. Now it's time to plane the lock style on the other side of the door. When I turn this door over, I don't flip it, I roll it. The X and the scribe lines always stay against my bench. Here's how to roll a heavy door. First, I pick, us, I pick this end up out of the hook until it's standing on that edge. And then with my back straight, I pick up the whole door and carry it up to the head of my door, the head of my door bench. And then I roll the door back down, just like this. Now I've got the whole weight of the door, but just for a moment, and set that end on the floor. And now I can set this end down back on the rung in my door bench and then come back down to this end and pick up just half the weight of the door. Once again, I don't bend my back, I don't bend my knees much. I pick up the whole weight of the door just for that one moment. You know, with this little door, it's not such a big deal. I mean, I can take this door out of here and roll it over in the air. But most of the time, you're not gonna find yourself hanging lightweights like this. You're gonna be hanging big, heavy doors. Once again, I'm going to plane the edge of this door until it's pretty close to parallel to my scribe line. I'm changing the depth of cut as I go, dialing the cutter down. I'm not looking right beneath the plane. I'm not looking right here. I'm looking ahead of the plane, so I'll be ready when I get to that area, and I can dial the planer down to the exact depth that I need it. Now I'm gonna set the plane to take off about a sixteenth of an inch, and I'll make several clean passes. If 
the planer leaves any marks, sometimes I'll get a small nick in the planer blade, which will leave a slight ridge or lines in the wood, or sometimes if you go too fast, you'll get some ridges in the wood. Then I use my Rotex sander with some 80 grit Reuben. The Rotex is a lot easier to use and a lot easier to control than a belt sander. Plus, when you use that, there's hardly any sawdust. Now we're going to bore for the lock. I use a boring jig for this. It's a lot faster, it's totally dependable, and you don't have to think about what you're doing, at least once the jig's set up. And you never have to worry about coming out the edge of the door with a bit once you have the back set set up. And that's about all you have to do with a lock boring jig. Lock sets and hinges both have a back set. On a lock, the back set is the measurement from the edge of the door to the center of the lock. You can check the back set of a lock by measuring the latch. Most latches these days are adjustable from 2 and 3 eighths to 2 and 3 quarter. Locks in residential homes usually have a 2 and 3 eighths back set. Locks in commercial buildings usually have a 2 and 3 quarter inch back set. But don't let that rule fool you. A two and three quarter inch back set looks great on any door with a four and a half or five inch lock style, whether it's in a commercial building or a home. A lock boring jig is just like a little drill press. No matter what, you don't have to worry about drilling out the side of the door, but you do have to be careful about running into one bit with the other. Trust me on that one. This bit runs in right from the side, and that's the face bore. This bit runs right into the top of the jig, and that's the edge bore. So I can set the jig up right on the door, just like so. Most jams are already pre-drilled for a lock. This one wasn't. And what we'll do is, we'll make sure that we drill this lock centered on the lock rail. The lock rail measures 6 and 5 eighths, so I'll go 3 and 5 sixteenths. That's going to put the lock right here. And then I'll take my square and I'll bring that line up to the edge of the door. So I have a good score line across the top of the door. Then I can take my boring jig and I can take the spur bit and put it right onto that line and drop the jig down so it slides right into position and then tighten it up. Now, you can use a cordless drill like this to drill these, but watch what happens. they'll stop <laughs> because I'm trying to bore a really big hole with a, with a spur bit and a cordless drill just isn't meant for that. What you really need to use is a large drill motor, electric corded drill motor, and I've got a 3 inch inch drive on the end of this so I can hook it right up to the spur bit and run this through the door. The nice thing about this boring jig is, even though I came through the side of the door real hard and fast, the boring jig backs up the hole so you don't have any tear out. And you'll notice I'm pulling the bit out right now. I'm taking the bit out of the jig right now so that when I drill the edge bore, I don't run into that bit. Now here's a really kind of a cool tip. You might appreciate this one day. Take a piece of blue tape before you run your edge bore bit. Take a piece of blue tape, put it around the bit right up near the top, just so long as it clears the, the uh, bushing on the boring jig. And that way when you're drilling a hollow core door, as the bit comes down through the face bore, the bit won't fall down inside the door 
the tape will stop it from dropping through the boring jig. My brother did that once, and we had to cut the bottom of the door off to get the bit back. I mean, the bit's worth 30 bucks. You know, it's worth more than the door sometimes, but then you gotta hang a new door because you can't leave the bit rattling around inside of the door. Now, I'm ready to mortise for this latch. So I'm gonna take my latch mortise template here. I'm gonna set this right on top of the door and I'm going to center it right on top of that bore. And I can do that because I've got lines right on the top of the template that line up with the line I left when I marked the edge of the door. I'm going to use a different router for this. I've got a Festool MFK router here. And, and by the way, these templates, you can get these made by Templeco too. Templeco not only makes the um, hinge template like this one, but they make a complete set of lock templates. So you can get lock and latch templates and strike templates in one set from Templeco. But right now, I'm going to use this template and this router, which I've also got a um, template guide in, to run the mortise for this latch. This is kind of a cool router because the extended base on it allows you to set this router on here and it won't tip or anything. I've got it set for the depth of the latch. I use a different router for mortising latches and another one for mortising lock strikes on jams. That's because hinge mortises, latch mortises, and strike mortises are all cut to different depths. And once I have a router dialed in for a specific piece of hardware, like the hinges or this latch right here, I don't want to mess with it. Dedicating routers to specific tasks is one of the secrets to picking up real speed when you hang doors. Now I can pull this template off of here and take my corner chisel to square these corners up. We're ready to hang this door and see if it fits. There's two ways to hang a door in a jam. The hard way, by pulling the pins out and separating the hinge leaves, and the easy way, tipping the door up into the top hinge mortise. That's the way I hang them, especially because I've always worked alone, and tipping the door up is the only way to hang a door, especially a tall, heavy one, all alone. You start by putting the door inside the jam. So I'm going to slide this back and keep it inside the jam. Now make sure the door is at 90 degrees to the opening and tip the door up. Now when you do this, it's probably going to hit the top of the jam. Just kick the back of the jam a little bit and it'll slide forward and when it does, it'll just clear the head jam there. And now you can tip it up the rest of the way. And then take the hinge and line the hinge up so that the top screw lines up with the screw hole in the jam. And once it's lined up, you can set the door back down and pick up your screw gun and Put the door back up again and put one screw through the top hinge, just like that. You don't have to snug that down real hard because you're going to be picking the door up and moving it around. And you don't have to get this hinge perfectly aligned with that mortise. You can take care of the rest of that later. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my foot now and I'm going to hold it against the bottom of the door here. And I'm going to just put enough pressure on it to pick the door up in the air. Now, when I do that, it's going to drop down just a hair on this hinge because it's just one screw holding it. But that's cool. I'm going to fix that later. Right now, I'm going to go on down to the bottom of the door and put one screw into the bottom hinge. If there was a middle screw right here, a middle hinge right here, I'd put a screw in that one too first before I went down into the bottom one. So I'll put one in here first. Once you have a screw in each hinge, place a pry bar right underneath the edge of the door there and lift it up. Now, I recently found this door jack, 
And it's been the greatest thing I've found for lifting doors and probably drywall too, because it's lightweight. It's a lot lighter than the door lifter I once used. And this one fits right in my tool bag. It's lightweight, it's made from recycled plastic with little bits of steel in it. So it's plenty strong enough, it's durable, it'll last a long time, and it'll lift a door over an inch and a half off the floor. I could lift this door clear up into the air, which is cool because if you cut a door off for carpet or thick stone, it's gonna be a lot farther off the floor than this one is. Now, I can pick the door up with that and just put my foot on it right here and put some weight on it and then drive in this screw and put in this next one, just like so. And you can see that hinge went right into the mortise. Now, I'm gonna put in a longer screw on that third hole right here. And that long screw will reach behind the jam into the trimmer. And now I'll do the same thing for the top. Put a little weight on this, a little weight on the door jack, and put this bottom screw in. And that'll pull the hinge right into the mortise. And then I'm gonna use that longer screw in that middle hole, just like I did on the bottom. There we go. So, we got the door up here now. In the moment of truth, let's see if it fits. Well, at least it clears. And it doesn't fit that bad, but it doesn't fit great. Let's look at this real close and I'll show you what I'm talking about. The head gap, let's start right there. The head gap across the top, and look here. At this side of the door, right above the lock style, the head gap's too big. And over here, it's just about right. But let's see the whole thing now before we go too far. The gap on the lock style, right up here near the head, is way too tight. It's almost rubby. And as you follow this down, you notice that the gap on the jam, on the strike jam there, is actually pretty good at the bottom. Now, let's look at the other side, too. We need to see this, the whole picture here. We want to see the whole picture. On this side, the gap right above the top hinge is a little bit big. And down, as we follow that down, it's a little big through here. And down here, it's just a hair big, but it's actually pretty good down there. So. What I'm doing here is I'm looking at the whole picture. Like I said when we started this program, if you want to control chaos, you really need to see the whole picture before you do anything with a door. A door is really nothing more than one rectangle inside another rectangle. There's the rectangle of the door, and there's the rectangle of the jam. You can adjust the door to fit the jam by pivoting the door at this point, which is the top hinge, and at this point, which is the bottom hinge, you do that by adjusting the hinges. Now, let me talk about that real quick. I've got a pair of hinges here, a brand new one. Here's a brand new pair in a box. I'll pull this out. Let me get the screws out of here. And look at these. If you look at these real close, you'll notice that the gap between the hinge leaves right here on this pair of hinges is bigger than the gap between these two hinge leaves on this hinge. That happens all the time. That's because hinges aren't made in a mold. They're made in a stamp machine. You know, they're stamped out. This bend that's stamped into each hinge, it's called the swag of the hinge. This bend in the hinge is what allows the hinge to close without the leaves touching each other when the door closes. That swag gives you your leaf gap or hinge gap right there. And that hinge gap is what determines what your gap is between the door and the jam. And what we need to do here is adjust that hinge gap because obviously they're not the same in order to adjust the door inside the rectangle of the jam. So we are going to pivot the door around the top hinge and the bottom hinge to get this fit right. Now let's look at this again. I want to bring the door up right here so that I close up this head gap right here. And I also want to bring the door back in this direction closer to this jam so I close up this hinge gap here, and I increase this strike gap right here. Well, there's two ways to do this. There's two ways to bend a hinge, and I call it the spread and the squeeze. This is the spread. If I take a nail set and I put it inside of the hinge barrel and I hold it up tight against the knuckles on the hinge and then close the hinge on it, if I shut the door on it, I can squeeze this hinge and spread these two leaves apart and that'll increase the gap between the two leaves, which is one way of taking the door and moving it away from the jam. 
Conversely, I can take a crescent wrench and I can take the wrench and close it up right around the knuckles on the hinge and pull the hinge in this direction. And what I'll be doing is taking the crescent wrench and putting it right on the knuckle of the hinge and pulling it in this direction toward the lock style. I'm going to talk about that more in just a second. I can pull the hinge toward the lock style and that will pull the door back to the jam. I want to show you that one really closely, but first, let's use the spread first. Let's spread the hinge first. And the hinge we want to spread isn't this top one. We want to squeeze that top one. We want to spread the bottom one. We want to take the bottom one and spread it so that this door comes up tighter to the head jam. So I'm going to do that by opening the door, putting my nail set back here inside of this leaf, and then closing the door right on that nail set. All right. That's probably enough to pick this door up. And it is. We've picked the door up a little bit. And now I want to take the door and move it back toward the hinge jam. And in order to adjust that hinge, we want to squeeze it. In order to squeeze it, I'm going to drive the pin up until it's just engaging these top knuckles. I don't want it in the bottom ones. And then I'm going to grab a hold of that hinge with my crescent wrench. And when I do, I'm not going to pull the hinge back this way. That might be what you're tempted to think about doing, but it's not the right way to move the door. You want to take the door, you want to grab the hinge and bend the hinge in this direction toward the lock strike. And you want to be careful to grab the leaf that's attached to the door, not the leaf that's attached to the jam. You want to move the door. You don't want to move the jam. Now, this is really critical. When you bend these hinges, when you squeeze them with a wrench, if you grab the leaf that's attached to the jam and you bend that leaf back toward the jam in an attempt to move the door back to the jam, you're going to close up the leaf gap immediately. Then when you close the door, you're going to have a hinge that's bound, that's leaf bound. The only way you can do this is to grab the hinge that's attached to the door and bend it toward the strike. That knuckle was real easy to bend because there's no pin in it. This one's going to be harder, but I get a nice little tweak on it. And now I can drive that back down with my hammer, and it'll be easy to get the pin to come all the way through the bottom two knuckles. There we go. And as it comes down, it pulls that door back. And look, this gap is getting really nice now. I can even bend that hinge more if I want to. And the reason I can do it is because I bevel both sides of the door. I bevel the lock style and I bevel the hinge style. And this is really critical. If you bevel the hinge style, when the door is closed like this, the leaf on the hinge is opened up a little bit more. You've exaggerated the openness of that hinge so that you can actually squeeze that hinge a little bit more with a crescent wrench and pull that door back over to this jam a little bit more than you'd normally be able to without risking ending up with a hinge that's leaf bound. So this fits pretty good now. Good enough for my studio. Hey, look who's here. It's Jacob. Say hi to the camera. Say hi. Good boy. You know what? These hinge adjustments that we just made on this door, we're going to use some of the same ones when we adjust pre-hung doors, and that'll be in the next program. When I install a lock strike, I like the latch to fall into the strike just as the door comes up snug against the doorstop. I use two techniques to locate the strike, and they're both fast and foolproof. If you watch the Boring Jig slideshow, you probably saw the aluminum locator that comes with the Templeco jig. I slide that locator into the edge bore, shut the door, then reach through the face bore and push against the back of the locator. The locator leaves a small dimple on the jam. I circle the dimple right away so I know exactly where to center my drill bit. If the lock doesn't come with a dust bucket, I use a 15 16 inch bit for the strike hole and drill the hole about 3 quarters of the way through the jam. For a deadbolt, I drill all the way through the jam and a little bit into the trimmer too. Templeco makes plastic locators too that make it really easy to position a latch or strike template in a 15 16 or 1 inch hole. Just stick the locator in the hole, then position the template on top of it. 
The Festool MFK router is perfect for cutting latch and strike mortises. It picks up a lot of the dust and the router is easy to control and hold on to. If the hardware has square corners, it's easy to square up the mortise with a corner chisel. Here's another method that also works well for locating strikes, especially for mortise locks where you can't use the aluminum locator. Set the strike on top of the latch, snug against the tang. Then trace a pencil line on the face of the strike. Blue tape makes it easier to see the line. Next, close the door and hold it snug against the stop, then trace a line on the jam along the face of the door. Align the strike with the line on the jam. I fastened a piece of tape to both sides of this strike so you can see the line clearly. Make sure the strike is also centered vertically on the latch. Then trace a line with a very sharp 2 and 5 tenths pencil all the way around the strike. Use a template and router to mortise the strike or, for one-off strikes, make sure your chisels are sharp enough to shave hair, then cut the mortise the old-fashioned way, by hand. I've tried using a lot of different manufactured templates. Rather than going negative about the templates I don't use, I'll describe the templates I do use and why I use them. I use the Bosch adjustable templates a lot for custom window and door hangs, but let's be clear about this. I only use this system when I'm doing more than two or three hangs. I won't set this template up for a single hang, but it's really handy if there are multiple doors with the same hinge layout. This template system is fully adjustable in hinge size and door thickness. It takes a little learning, but once you understand the adjustments, you can switch the setup very quickly. One of the reasons I stick with the Bosch system is because you can switch between left-hand and right-hand doors without turning the template upside down. And you don't have to remove adjustable stops either. This is the only adjustable template system that allows you to do that which means you can hook your doors at the top to position the template, which is a real advantage. I've purchased the full set and a couple of extra hinge templates too, so I can install up to six hinges. I don't have all of them in this picture, but with three spacer lengths, I can work on short windows and doors, 6, 8, and 7, 0 doors, and doors from 8 foot to 10 foot tall. And it's also easy to make quick spacers out of wood for anything taller. For an occasional new door in an old jam, I'll use a single template made by Templeco. I always use full length 6, 8, 7, 0, and 8, 0 Templeco templates on new jams where there's no need to use my Bosch adjustable template. I've just found those Templeco templates are really precise. They position my hinges right where I want them and they're durable. Plus, they don't cost an arm and a leg, so if something happens to one of them, it's not that big of a deal to replace it. I make a lot of templates. I save a lot of them too, though sometimes I shouldn't. Templates are pretty easy to make, especially with the tools we have today, so you don't need to save every single one of them. But I start by ripping the center spacers. Because I use a half inch bit and a 9 16 template guide, I rip the spacers a sixteenth of an inch wider than the hardware. But for this D strike, I went much wider because it projects out the front of the mortise. I position the spacers on the center of the back rail, marking the height and adding an eighth inch overall. While I have the spacers against the back rail, I locate the pocket screw holes. I use a Craig Foreman for drilling those holes, though a simple Craig jig works just fine. I fasten one spacer with pocket screws, then lay out the height exactly for the other spacer, an eighth of an inch more than the hardware. The Craig clamp holds the spacer in precisely the right location. When I cut aluminum on my saw stop, I disengage the safety mechanism. Yep, I learned that one the hard way. The edge of a lock strike template can't be more than an eighth inch thick. I started using eighth inch aluminum lately rather than steel because aluminum is much easier to work with. The fasteners must be countersunk deep in the aluminum edge, otherwise they'll hit the door stop and interfere with positioning the template properly. Clamp the edge to the template so that it's perfectly flush with the top of the template, so that a router will ride smoothly across the top. Then use a Vix bit to drill pilot holes for the screws. 
The template pens are the toughest part. Yeah, you'd think by now that I'd have a set of stops for my drill bits. I do, I just can't find them. Start by drilling the countersink hole from the bottom of the template, not the top. Then finish the hole with a bit that's slightly wider than the template pen threads. If the holes are a little tight, you may want to smack the pen with a mallet. But once the threads start to appear on the top side, spin on the nut and tighten it up until the bottom of the pen is flush or slightly deeper than the bottom of the template. The only source I know of for template pens is Templeco. Here's their web address. There aren't that many choices when it comes to professional lock boring jigs. I'd recommend using only a professional jig. They're a little expensive, but these things are handy for a lot of other tasks besides just boring for locks. Like drilling for extension flush bolts and boring holes all the way through doors for electric lashes and strikes, but I'll cover those subjects in a later program on advanced techniques. I've always used a classic engineering boring jig. It's available with carbide bits, but doesn't come with any templates or other fancy extras. But I like this tool because you can switch between 2 and 3 quarter inch and 2 and 3 eighths inch back sets very quickly, just by adjusting a spring-loaded stop on each side of the jig. Templeco makes a great boring jig too, that's also available in a full kit with everything you'll ever need for installing locks, including all the templates and template locators. The only negative about the Templeco jig are the back set stops. They have to be removed to switch from 2 and 3 quarter inch to 2 and 3 eighths inch back sets. You can store the stops on board the jig, which is one way to prevent losing them. Like I said, this jig comes with everything. These red locators make it easy to position a template after boring a 1 inch hole for a latch or lock strike. There's also a corner chisel in the kit and a quick release adapter for chucking up the boring bits in your drill motor. Carbide bits are also available for this kit at an extra charge, but they're worth every penny. An aluminum locator is included with the kit. See the installing lock strike slideshow for how to use that tool. All the standard strike templates come with the kit, the Schlage long deadbolt strike and the T-strike. And all the standard latch templates are in the kit too, for deadbolts and lock sets. Making a door hook isn't hard. Like a lot of things, it just takes time. Because it's so hard to do later, I start by cutting a notch in the jam hook. Clean up that notch pretty good so the burrs won't cut the rubber when you pull real hard on the hook. I use a couple of blocks of wood as gauges, which makes it a lot easier to bend the metal square perfectly straight and at the right elevation. Yep, that's an old screwdriver. To bend the door hook section, I start by making a right angle, leaving a 3 quarter inch tab in the vise. I'll drill the holes and connect the rubber to that tab later. I use a 1 and a half inch gauge block to set up for the first bend. That's the riser that forms the back of the door hook. I use a 2 inch gauge block to set up the next bend, which forms the mouth of the door hook section. Next, I measure down two and a quarter inches from the front of the hook. The extra three quarters of an inch is for bending an angle on the front jaw. I cut a piece of aluminum about a half inch wide and clamp it down on top of the hook before drilling the two bolt holes. After that, the assembly goes really fast. Honest.
This is the fence system we used to use. Worked really well. Disadvantage is, when you're running along, one drift and you've just ruined everything you've done. We used this for restyling and railing doors for years. Would not use it anymore. Now with the Festool Lucite Jig, once you've set it up, you don't have to hold, worry about drift, or have someone that's actually skilled doing the work.